Welcome to As the Story Grows, I'm Brian Patton. Today we welcome Cross Keys frontman and Cinepunk's host, Joshua Alvarez, to the podcast. Cross Keys will release their sophomore album, Believes in You, next Friday, May 5th. Josh talks about his love for movies and podcasting about it, the horrors of teaching, getting tattoos that make him smile, writing about the hardest time in his life, Pedro Pascal, and more. We covered a lot of ground in a short time. There are moments on this podcast that feel like I'm not interviewing a band, but just talking to a friend I haven't seen in years, and this was one of those moments. It was a real joy getting to talk to Josh, and I hope we get to hang out again in the future. If you're a Patreon member, Mosh Mix Volume 2 is now live. Enjoy. Patreon.com slash As The Story Grows. You get early access to every podcast, as well as our brand new Mosh Mixes and more. All right, I hope you guys enjoy getting to know Joshua Alvarez from Cross Keys. Gonna see my friends tonight. Gonna dance and sing and fight. Stage lights are going down. We shine bright. I mean, you sound great, so you're cool. Oh. I, yeah. I, just, I just use this because I like to look professional, right? Like, <laughs> really professional. Well yeah. done. Yeah. In a tra- <laughs> no, uh, I normally use a Zoom H6 for when I do Cinepunks with, um, I believe you know my friend Liam. So I use this guy. Oh, nice. And um, do you know Liam from Cinepunks? No. He said that he talked to you about Zayo. Maybe. I don't know. You guys uh, are popular, so it's cool. I get it. Uh, uh, you can't uh, remember every nerd. Well, <laughs> well, there was there was an older host before me on this pod. So mm. I don't know if you just mentioned the pod name and he went, "Oh yeah, I know that." So maybe that's it. Yeah, Cinepunks is um, it's a ten year old podcast that I've been doing with uh, Liam O'Donnell, who actually lives in Chicago now, but it focuses on punk and movies in the Philadelphia region. So you know, really nerdy. Yeah. Very, very nerdy. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> well, th- the other thing I was like, okay, do I know a Liam? Because I lived in Philly for six years. Oh, no so, shit. Yeah. I moved uh, back to DC in 21. So, yeah. So I was like, ba- maybe, maybe I just. <laughs> Is that where you are now? You're in DC right now? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. So it's, all, it's always a great when Philly peeps come on the show because I'm like, I don't know. Are you in Philly or are you in fucking Cherry Hill? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm in Philadelphia proper, but the cash money Kensington. So that's where I'm at. Nice. I lived in Fishtown. Yeah. Uh, pizza right brand. next to there. So yeah. where are we? Oh, yeah, I know. You're right on Frankfurt. Oh, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm right down the street from there. So nice. I'm, I'm like a block up from the Murder Mart, if you know where that is. Yes. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. Yeah, I do. yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> That's also bad. Well, thanks for hanging out this morning. This is why you became a rock star for 10 a.m. press interviews. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, rock star is a pretty good name. I like that, but it, yeah. that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, so it's cool. Normally, yeah. this is a Cinepunks hour, but I had to push. So, like, I'm recording this today, and then we do another show called Lunch with Liam, where I talk to Liam while he eats his lunch. <laughs> and then we do, um, we're doing a regular episode today where we're talking, um, the King of Comedy, my Martin Scorsese movie from, uh, yeah. I think it's 82. I don't know. It's good. Nice. So that's, um, it's a day of podcast for your boy, which that's, I'm okay with. That's nice. That's nice. What got you into podcasting? Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty fabled and long story. It's a, uh, Liam and I were the only non-white people in the Philadelphia Film Society. <laughs> and um, we were the only tattooed people. And they were like, you know, just, we saw this movie called Love. Do you know this movie? Not the one by... Um, Gaspar Noé. It was an Oscar contender, like maybe in 2012, 2013. And um, it's fucking three hours of old white people just being old. <laughs> and then at the end, the guy smothers the wife with the pillow, you know? And it was like three hours, right? And we watched it with, because like we were pretty high up in the, um, in the film society. So we got to watch it in an Oscar screening room with like 12 seats, you know? And it was like us and like a bunch of other, like, you know, hege- hegemonic types. So like old yeah. white rich people. Sure. And, um, <laughs> Fucking at the end of the movie, one of those people is talking to me and he was like, well, what'd you think? 
And I said, well, it's no Dumb and Dumber, but I thought it was pretty cool. And then he was like, well, what's Dumb and Dumber? And I was like, don't oh, you shit. fucking lie to me. You know what the <laughs> fuck Dumb and Dumber is, you liar. So then uh, me and Liam dipped, and we are just like, you know, we're just going to do our own thing. And uh, we started Cinepunks like that week. And then nice. that was, yeah, fucking 10 years ago. So That's stupid. Cool. I don't know. It's, 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 ten, it's a decade of heartache and pain, but, you know, party on, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keeping at it. Keeping at it. What? <laughs> Well, well, this just led to like, how'd you get end up in the film society and this love for movies? I don't know. It's just, I worked at movies. I worked at Vintage Vinyl for a long time. And um, I worked in uh, video stores when I lived in Bayonne for a while. And it was just like, that's just what I, you know, nice. master of all media, baby. I, I got a, yeah. I, I got a fierce book game too. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. all the stuff you do when you're a lonely kid, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. When me and my wife first started dating and I would go to the movies and she, like at 10 a.m. in the morning by myself, she'd be like, mm. "Why?" And I'm like, "Oh, because the theater's empty." And I don't. When the fuck else you're gonna see bad movies? Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what I'm saying, man, that's the best way to do it, dude. Are you yeah. a cinephile as well? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, you, and you play in a band too? No, no, just play, just a musician. I'm, I see I'm, all the stuff in your in your room. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I tried to be a musician, but not, that's, same, that's, man, same. I feel you. <laughs> <sorry, I'm not laughs> I can dig it, man. That's cool, though. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's just jump back. Where'd you grow up? I am from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. All right. Yeah. Cherry I know. Hill. Suburban. It's it's intense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what was that uh, growing up like? I mean, you know, it's have you you've been to Cherry Hill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, like I don't know, it's suburban. Yeah. When I grew up, I thought that um, well, you know, I was like one of a few Filipino people in the area and like my parents all emigrated to america at the same time in like the early 60s and their whole crew came during like that filipino brain drain do you know mm -hmm. about that yeah so they came and they all became nurses and i thought everybody was a nurse <laughs> and that all white people were jewish which is you know <laughs> growing up in cherry hill it's like yeah that seems about right like yeah. every filipino <laughs> person you know is a nurse and every white person you know is a jewish person so you know growing up in cherry hill was like it was fine. It wasn't yeah. the worst thing I've done, but it was also just like, Hey, we're just going to be weird adults because, you know, and like picked up an early proclivity towards horror movies, which is like a thing. And then like, <laughs> you know, I grew up like completely ensconced in like British music. So I, I grew up listening to Morrissey and the Smiths and the cure and, you know, like a bunch of like blur and Oasis, but also bands like, um, Gene, uh, bands like, um, uh, I don't know, charlatans, like all that stuff. And then mm -hmm. that's how I, that was the path that I took to get into hardcore and punk somehow. Yeah. So I don't know, like somehow electing to, to listen to like not the coolest music and then becoming like <laughs> a punk rocker while you're the only Filipino in Cherry Hill, like not a very fun time. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But yeah. eh, we made it. Didn't yeah. kill us. Where are you from? <laughs> are you, you're from DC originally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Suburbs of DC. Yeah. How old are you? 38. Okay, cool. Right on. Were you going to shows in DC and all that stuff? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Fort awesome. Re Fort Reno is that Fugazi's last show at Fort Reno? Nice. It's wow. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. I've been to the Nine Thirty Club. I've been to the Black Hat. Um, oh yeah. We played at uh, the Pie Shop. That was a really fun show. Yeah, and, that's uh, like a new venue like that popped up while I was in Philly. Yeah, that was a good time. The first show I played in DC was at a place called the Warehouse Next Door. It was, it was a kid named Dozer booked it. He used to be in a band called the 1905 hmm. and they're pretty like fun, hardcore band, but yeah. that was like the first time I ever played there. And it was a really interesting time. You know? Yeah. It's a cool city. It's obviously a big music history. If you've like punk and hardcore. And mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> might've might come up a time or two because you were in Cherry Hill. Like when you got into punk and hardcore, I assume you're just crossing the bridge over to Philly for shows all the time. And mm -hmm. in, in that scene, it's a great scene in Philly. Well, I mean, here's the thing, right? Like I, I grew up in Cherry Hill and then mm -hmm. in 95, I moved to Elizabeth, New Jersey to go to college. Yeah. And I was there from 95 to 02. Well, I mean, I was so 95 to 2000, I was in school. And then 2000 to 2002, I taught in Linden. Cause I used to be a high school teacher. Huh. So you got to understand, right? Like from 95 to like, Oh two, you were most of my music stuff was like up that way. Yeah. And it was fun. You know, I did a lot of basement shows and went to saw a lot of things. I lived with a dude who was an ensign for a while. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like, it was a lot of, it was a lot of rock and roll. Yeah. And again, I worked at vintage vinyl, you know, that store. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah so like i worked there during like college and stuff and i mean it was a very interesting fun time yeah yeah, yeah. what did you uh, go to school for secondary education and biology oh. yeah you yeah said you were a teacher so yeah Oh yeah, I'm not a teacher anymore. It's cool. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was terrible. I had a full <laughs> head of hair when I started teaching and I never tasted alcohol and I never smoked a cigarette. And then two years later I was bald as this. And then um I was drinking forties like a rapper and smoking a pack a day. It was just oh, awful. Oh, yeah, I man. couldn't handle it. And I was just like, I'm moving to Philadelphia. And then that was that, you know. Oh man. Uh what uh what point did you start playing in beds in high school or no, I didn't start no. till after I moved to Philly. Oh yeah. yeah. So 2002, 2003, I did my first two bands. I did um, a band called Belagost, which was a non-vocal Lord of the Rings themed um, <laughs> post-rock band, but it was with uh, reputable punks, right? So it was yeah. with um, dudes that were in Crucial Unit, dudes that were in The Fighting Dogs, Hapasha, Carpenter Ant, like those bands, you know? And then um, I did another band at the same time, like simultaneously started the two of them, where I sang and played bass for, it was called Hey Angel. And that was with me and Dave Adolph, who's in Cross Keys now. Who's yeah. like he's been my best friend since seventh grade, nice. and we've always, you know, been musical counterparts, you know. And um, our other friend Brendan Hill. So Dave and Brendan had been in a band before, and then I moved home, and then we started this new band. And it's funny because Belagost and Hey Angel, we played our first shows on the same weekend. Right. <laughs> it was it was a lot for you know a multi instrumentalist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What at what age did you start playing an instrument? Um, I started playing guitar when I was in high school. Okay. So like 13, 14 around there. And um, like I said, I was raised in a lot of British music, but also a lot of like American folk. So I mm -hmm. learned, I learned how to play on an acoustic guitar by listening to Simon and Garfunkel and stuff like that. So that's how, like, that's why I have like a weird playing style now, I think, because <laughs> like it's based in finger style guitar, you know? Yeah. So, you know, also, I'm not a very good player. It'd be weird <laughs> if I was. I, I I don't know how to. I'm not a good player, so I know how to do bells and whistles, but that's yeah. about it. You know. Yeah, yeah. I took lessons for I don't know, three months or something, and the guy who taught me like taught me all the basic chords and then some songs, and was like, "Okay, that's that's all I got. You're on your own. <laughs> You're done. Enjoy." And then I was like, and then I discovered punk, and I was like, "Okay, I need an electric guitar." And then I was like, "Oh." Three chords. I got it. Done. <laughs> done and done. That's and I, I've, I've not progressed much past that. <laughs> but none of us have, Brian, so it's cool, man. You right, know? right. Then you discover pedals, and you're like, oh, cool. I can, <laughs> I can manipulate my three chords. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did uh, Cross Keys get started? Uh, I don't know. We've all been homies. Yep. I mean, like I said, Dave's been my best friend since seventh grade. And uh, when Hey Angel kind of dissolved, like, not that it... We, we never played a last show, but... Um, mm -hmm. We each had done different bands between and like the interim. And then um, eventually Dave just called me up and he's like, yo, let's do like a, a band with just friends. And I was like, yeah, because like, I, I don't know if you know, like I've been in a lot of bands with a lot of people that I met just through the channels of punk rock and hardcore. And uh, I've been kicked out of a lot of bands, too. So, <laughs> you know, like that's why I refuse to do bands like Craigslist bands anymore. Yeah, yeah. And um, Dave had this idea. He's like, well, why don't we just do it with all the homies? So then we, we were friends with Andrew, we're friends with, with Dr. Bo. So we asked them if they wanted to play. And Bo was actually finished. He was like, I'm done. I'm not doing music anymore. Okay. And I was like, well, why don't we do just like one last ride? And he was like, well, if you're doing it, I'll do it. So then he joined. And then um, the original drummer was Brandon Wallace. Who uh, Do you know who he is? No. He played in Champion. He was in um, he was in American Nightmare like during the demo days, like the early. And then he was in a band from Philly called Damage. He was in Christ. He was in I Hate You. And um, I knew him because he played drums. Well, I mean, we've been friends again a long time, mm -hmm. but also he played drums in another band that I had done called Halo of Snakes, which was like a hardcore band that I sang for. And so he was the original drummer and he came to one practice and then he never showed up again. <laughs> left, his, <laughs> left his drums for a couple months. And then we got... Um, Steve Roach, who uh, played in Off Minor, and he was in he he does permanent hearing damage records here in Philly, so he okay. he does a recording studio, and uh, I knew him from like so like you know how West Philly's kind of divided like yeah. that's the punk guys, and then like Center City like other hardcore in Philly is like more hardcore like thuggy yeah. kind of thing. Um, growing well, having started in that West Philly scene, I knew a bunch of those people. So Steve was one of my friends from those days. And then he played drums on the first EP, which is called, uh, I'm just happy that you're here. Yeah. And then, um, 
Dave, what he left because he wanted to do a, um, here, well, the Seisha stuff was coming up. So he had to do all that stuff. And not that that's why he left, but he was wanted to play that style of music more, which is cool. And, you know, respectfully, we're still friends and he's still one of my very good, good homies, you know, but then, um, Dave wagon sheets was, he was home and not playing. So I was like, yo man, we need a drummer. And, um, I've known him for a pretty long time. Most of us have known each other for a very long time. So I'm just going to stop saying that. But, um, <laughs> I knew wags cause, uh, I did merch for kid dynamite a bunch back in the day. And, uh, you know, he's always just a dude that I got along with. So he is our current and hopefully final drummer and we'll never hopefully. have to get another one. Again. <laughs> yeah, I know. How'd you guys uh, get connected with Hellminded for Saviors? Um, so Joseph, who did Hellminded, he used to do a uh, Corgasm Zine, and he used to do um, he put out the tie that binds comp. But um, when I was in Halo of Snakes, he was friends with George, who played guitar in that band because George was in Autumn, and he helped with a bunch of the Autumn stuff. So then when when I started playing Cross Keys, it was just like kind of a natural like yeah. you know. For some reason, <laughs> Joe's like, I like your music. Let's put it out. I'm like, really? This stuff? Okay, let's do it. So then he did. And um, yeah, it was a pretty good relationship. That's right. Yeah, I remember getting Saviors, and I'm friends with uh, Billy Power, who used to be like old day and art, tooth and nail. And I was like, y'all like this record? And he was like, damn it, I was trying not to buy vinyl. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you bought the record. So I was like, it's good. Listen to it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for spreading the gospel, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> where'd, the, uh, where'd the name of the band come from? A little movie called The Grand Budapest Hotel. If you remember, Bill Murray yeah. was part of this whole chain of uh, concierges that were called the Society of the Cross Keys, and they were trying to help him see Gustav. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so Cross Keys came from that. Well, the joke is that, so I'm a big cinephile, and I'm a big tattoo enthusiast, yeah. and uh, I'm also a Wes Anderson fan. So when uh, <laughs> that movie happened, my wife and I both got the Cross Keys tattoo, okay. and when Cross Keys started, we, were, we didn't have a name, and Andrew is... Um, Andrew Welbrock, who plays bass, he's band dad. So he was like, well, how about this? Why don't we just name our band after one of your stupid tattoos? That way you don't have to get another stupid tattoo. <laughs> but the joke's on him. I got another cross keys tattoo after we started. So what's up? You know what I'm saying? Uh, is, <laughs> but, is, is that is that your thing with tattoos, like getting random or weird tattoos? or is it... Have you ever talked to somebody and they told you their tattoo stories? Uh, yeah. Have you ever talked to someone and they told you their drug stories? Uh, yes same party yeah. fucking sucks right yeah <laughs> so my thing is like instead of having these like super meaningful tattoos that are uh -huh. just like oh yeah it's colored after my favorite dead cat's ball and all this other <laughs> stuff i just get dumb tattoos by design because then they'll yeah. never make me unhappy and they're always going to make me smile yeah case in point i have a tattoo of um a fly see yeah. that yeah and it's it's from the method man line um always on some shit people call me the fly <laughs> so then I got it. So I could be like, yo, I'm the shit dog. That's how it is. <laughs> I know. Nice, stupid, nice. stupid tattoos. That's, that's great. You know, everybody's got their thing with tattoos and <laughs> it's, 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 it's all good. It's an interesting how time. I don't know. It's funny because it's like, I work in a tattoo removal company now. Uh -huh. And so, you know, <laughs> they're like, are you getting anything removed? I'm like, well, yeah, but not because I want to, not because yeah. they don't make me happy. Although that's not true either. I've been getting all my Morrissey tattoos removed since he's uh, racist now. So. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. Yeah, he sucks. So, yeah. you know, there's <laughs> that. But whatever. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. What, what led you to work in a tattoo removal job? So, after I taught and I moved to Philadelphia, I was like, I'm not teaching anymore. Ch kids are like drunk midgets. Did you know that? And like, no one like tells you in, in teacher school, like, oh yeah, the, you're not only going to be a teacher. You're also going to have to fight people sometimes and like maybe get hit in the head a bunch. And um, it, it was just like, yeah, I don't know. The public school system stinks, man. It's just not my favorite. And um, 
I moved to Philly and I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so then I got a job at Tower Records, getting paid like six bucks an hour, which is cool. Like, whatever. Like, I was figuring it out. But I also yeah. met my wife working at that job. So, haha, winner, winner. <laughs> and then um, while I was working there, I was just trying to think of like stuff to do. And I was like, well, Filipinos have pretty good luck in hospitals, so let's do that. And um, I worked for 20 years in a mental hospital around the way from here. So I did that. And then I got fired from that job, which is cool. It only took 20 years. And then I got a job at a casino as an overnight cashier, which is not where you want to find yourself in your 40s. It's a weird look. But um, I had this plan to become... <laughs> to become I just wanted a shark skin suit like I imagine the Temptations would have worn in the 60s. So I was just uh -huh. like, I got to become a pit boss. So then I, I don't know how to gamble or anything like that. So yeah. I was just like trying to learn as much as I could. And then um, my friend Mike DC, he was the one who he sang for Damnation AD and when Tigers fight yeah. and all that. He was like, yo, they need a, a person at the desk here at my job. Do you want to apply? And I was like. I don't know if you know, Mike, I got this shark skin suit plan in play right now. <laughs> He's like, just come to the interview, dude. And I was like, all okay. right, whatever. So then I went and then I just, they offered me the job and I took it that day. So that's how it happened. That's, that's right, man. <laughs> how did, <laughs> how was, uh, how was COVID for you in like lockdowns? How was that uh, Oof. for you um, and for the band? Well, lockdown sucked. Yeah. And then, and also I was working, so I worked um, inpatient acute psych. And when pandemic hit, you now have 24 people that are diagnosed as psychotic. And it took away all of the group therapy because you couldn't do group rooms. Mm -hmm. And it took away television. And mm -hmm. then it was like at that time, working in a hospital, we didn't know, you know, like what, covid was like we knew what it was but we didn't know like everybody has it or no one has it and we couldn't tell you know and like yeah. that hospital serviced a lot of the people in north philadelphia so it was a lot of people that were you know dual diagnosed and also had like drug issues and all this stuff and mm -hmm. a lot of them were really violent so you know we had to wear goggles and masks and all this stuff and it was like these people would still try and like fight us and still try and like you know, run away and all this other stuff where we're trying to help them and everything. Yeah. So uh, all a pandemic for most, well, it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was the least fun time. And uh, then I couldn't practice with my boys. So it was just like, we're doing these uh, remote like demo sessions that were yeah. kind of fun. And I don't know, Angie's the, the master of all that stuff. He's smarter than all of us. I don't know if you're aware. Okay. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the one that was like, yeah, we got to record us singing songs and stuff. I'm like, all right, man, if that's what you tell me you have to do, you're banned, so I do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, that's a, that was a terrible, terrible like time. I mean, like, it gave us what ended up informing the writing for the new record, which is called Cross Keys Believes in You. Yeah. So I guess and at the end of the day, it wasn't a total waste. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So, yeah. So that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. D despite this record coming out of COVID and like a really shitty time in human history, like this record sounds in, in sound alone sounds more positive and upbeat than uh, saviors did. So <laughs> really, I don't know if that's intentional or that, but that's my vibe listening to the two records that it's more like, it's got a little more pop punk to it. It's a little more like, I don't know. Po posy vibes. <laughs> wow. Posy. It's the <laughs> most negative thing I've ever written. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's one of those things where it's like, I've cultivated something of a self image where I like to, I like to be a helping person. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I only, I prefer to, to help people up as opposed to put people down and um, writing, writing for believes in you was, um, is daunting because yeah. it was awful, awful time. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I gotten fired from the hospital and it was like a bunch of stuff that wasn't supposed to be my fault, but then I still had to be like the fall guy kind of thing for it, which was a bummer. But then also it was just like, well, now what? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, I thought I was going to retire there. So it was pretty grim, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, if you listen to that record, it was the one time that I allowed myself to put um, as much of my anxiety and misgiving into a song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, uh, it was the most honest that I'd ever been with those things, which... You know, because you want to support the artifice of us helping people and you yeah. don't want to talk about the things that like, well, I didn't want to talk about the things that scared me. Yeah. I didn't want to talk about the things that made me unhappy. 
And um, with this record, I was like, well, all you have is, is fear and unhappiness right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, like my wife held me down and like, you know, supported me through like that really difficult time. But as an artist, it was just like, fuck man, I can't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't yeah. know how to help anyone right now because I'm screwed, yeah. you know? So it was like, so coming up with, um, with the words for this, for this record was a really, really difficult process for me. Yeah. Yeah. How does, how do those themes inform the title believes in you? Um, well, the record's coming out, right? We didn't die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have a job now. So it was like, it was one of those things where it was like, by the time we were finishing up, um, it was like, well, we can, we, we can still, despite showing this ugly side, mm-hmm. we can still continue on and not just be destroyed or defeated by this. So that's why the record sounds the way it does where it's, yeah. it's like dark themes, but then it also, I don't know. It, it, like you said, it ends on like a high note. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. 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 <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you, this record, uh, is coming out on a, a, a trio of labels. Uh, how did you, uh, pick who you were working with, with this record? Well, um, we started a record label so we could put it out on our own. Okay. And that is what dead satellite records. Is. Okay. So that's uh Dave, the guitar player, Dave, not the drummer. Um, that was his, his idea. He was like, well, what if we put it out ourselves mm-hmm. and that we would have like total control over everything. Not that um, we didn't like working with Hellminded, but it was just like, you know, that was our first like real like record record, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. even though people in the band had done this before, you know, we still had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. So then now we figured, well, we've been informed by a couple of years of playing on saviors. So why don't we do it ourselves? So we did. And then, um, Bo plays guitar in another band called God damn it. You know that band? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're great. They're awesome. So Eric yeah. does creep records. Yeah. And since we're a new label, Eric very graciously offered to help us. <laughs> and then, um, so, so that's how creep, got in and then um or how we got on creep it, that's like you know that's a big philly thing so it's like yeah, the, yeah. anything related to creep records is like holy shit man we did it you know yeah yeah <laughs> and then, um sell the heart was from california and um i think that they were in touch through either wags or andrew and uh they they offered their gracious help as well and um so we took them up so that's how it is right right i was trying to figure out what uh venue that was on the cover of the record what is that <laughs> That would be the Trocadero. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to think. Did I see a show there when I lived in Philly? I don't know if I ever did. It's a distinct possibility, man. It was like one of those central parts of being like, mm-hmm. I don't know. We grew up when that was like where we went. You know what I mean? Like being from Cherry Hill, I knew how to get to two places by train. And that was one of them. Yeah. And the other place was uh, the Stalag 13. So, mm-hmm. you know, or actually it was the church before that. And then I, you know, but uh, Stalag came after. But yeah. Being able to go to the truck or going to the church, like that was it. That's the only places I knew how to get to. Yeah. So and worked like a charm, you know. But yeah. the truck was like very big because like um, Andrew and Bo both worked there as bouncers. You know, um, our friend Ralph, who uh, he does pink bike Ralph printing. He uh, he also was a bouncer there, but he's like done a bunch of our shirts and all mm-hmm. that stuff, and just it's informed a lot of our life currently, which yeah. is why. I mean, it's funny too because I don't know if you noticed, but that song's like the weird outlier on the record that's the only one that's like not kind of fucked up you know what i mean like <laughs> i mean even though it kind of still is it's it's yeah. the only song on the record that i feel is like the one where i just got to like lean back there, there are two songs it's that and uh vena park i think are the two that i was like oh these are the ones i can just kind of lean into and just mm-hmm. like enjoy like the melodic things that i love about you know aggressive music yeah so so yeah but yeah that's so the name is the song of the of that song is called rest in peace arch street because mm-hmm. the tracks at 10th and arch and it's also named after a painting by our friend hawk crawl who did a a trocadero um poster and he called it rest in peace arch street so Somehow wrong, but they can 
What's uh? I mean, you guys are like older bands. Like the the benefit of the way the music scene works now is you know between Bandcamp, Spotify, you can put things out yourself and not have to worry about touring and like you know recouping a shit ton of money for a, <laughs> yeah. a massive label, right? So like or getting well, money at all. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. But what does was the rest of this year look like for you guys? For Cross Keys, I yeah. mean, we are really proud of this record. You know, you're one of the very few people who've heard it. You know, and it's like been a long time coming. So I'm like really happy to play out on yeah. these songs. You know what I mean? Like that's the one thing that we've collectively been like. All right, this is what we're doing this year. We're playing as much as we can, yeah. and we're just going to play in front of as many people as we can. You know, so that's the plan. Whether or not it works out for us, I don't even know, or what that would even look like working yeah. out. But I don't know. <laughs> just, just trying to ride till the wheels fall off, man. You understand yeah. that? Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. As as a movie fan, what movies have you been enjoying lately? Lately, I mean, I just saw the remake of Children of the Corn the other night, okay. and that was terrible. <laughs> that, was, that was not so much fun. Um, I got to take a couple of my coworkers to go see a, a press screener for Cocaine Bear a couple weeks ago. And that was a weird one, too, because, uh, you know, these press things, they give away, like, T-shirts and all this other yeah. posters and stuff. And at that one, they gave away straws. So that was weird. <laughs> 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 straws with dollar bills printed on them. Oh, my and, God. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it right here. Oh, holy that. shit. I know. It was weird, right? Like, what is <laughs> I mean, it's cool, man. Like, I was like, oh, weird straws. And then I was like, can I drink with these? They're like, probably not. They're printed on. I'm like. Okay, it's <laughs> just odd ephemera now. So, uh, but um, my favorite movie is I I really love, like I'm a movie nerd, man. Like I, I love Jodorowsky. Like I love like the Chilean surrealism of his movies in the '70s, but yeah. also the new ones. So like that's kind of I mean, again, we're doing a Scorsese episode today. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's one of those directors where you can be like, he's my favorite, or I hate him, mm-hmm. and both both answers are completely acceptable. So, yeah. um, it's I I don't know. That's lately. It's just, I've been, I mean, I'm waiting for John wick four <laughs> and I'm waiting for a fast 10 because I love both of those franchises. Yeah. And I mean, don't get it twisted. Like I've seen all the Fellini movies. I've, I've watched a bunch of like really smarty pants, like, you know, Agnes Varda, like I know all that shit, <laughs> but Vin Diesel jumping out of cars and fighting bad guys. Yeah. Keanu Reeves fighting Donnie Yen. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. 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 All in. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah. That's my shit. So, you know, that's what I've been on lately. <laughs> that and Pedro Pascal shepherding uh, children to safety. That's been another theme of things I've been watching. I'm way into. So, you know, there you go, man. There we go. Grogu, Grogu hanging out. Yeah. We just did an episode on um, Prospect. Did you ever see that movie? No. It's like his first movie, and he plays like an intergalactic harvester of gems. And it's like a lo fi sci fi movie that came out in 2018. It's wonderful. It's it's like if Wes Anderson directed a sci-fi movie. the record means a lot to us collectively. And I know that, you know, any band's going to say that, mm-hmm. of course, but um, I do think it's interesting that you honed in on the fact that it is overall a positive record. Like, what do you think about the record? I love it. I love it. I've, love I've is the it. word you'd use. Like you love it. I, I, th- I think it's great. Yeah. I'm like, and I had to go back. I had to go back and listen to saviors this morning because I've just been like, you know, on one, I've been just super busy. And so it's been like, interview after like i had one at 9 30 last night and then you this morning and it's just like i've I've been on on it so it's like a ton of music hitting me all the time and so it's it. trying to like slam but i've been listening to new record and i i enjoy it it's it's the type of music makes you want to go skateboard and hurt myself so um <laughs> well there you go man that, that would happen if i skateboarded right now i would hurt myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, man i get it yeah but I enjoyed it, but that's what made me go back to listen to Saviors. I was like, well, how does this compare? Because I like Saviors was one of my favorite records of 19. Really? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. Um, so listening back, I was like, oh, Saviors is like a little darker, a little more like uh, bad religion vibes. And this was, huh. I felt more like 
musically anyways had like that uplifting like pop punk spirit to it that was a little more like posy like i said like so right. wow. but i but i've enjoyed it a lot so yeah that's it's awesome great. Man. yeah thank you for listening to it yeah yeah it's one of those things man where it's like again this comes from the darkest part of my life yeah you know what i mean like literally the one most unstable part of my life is this and this is yeah. the document of that time mm-hmm. and to think that anyone would like it is terrifying to me because then that would mean like you're gonna read what i wrote down you know what i'm saying oh, right. it's like ah oh, shit but um it does give me hope that you enjoyed it and i really yeah. hope that people get a chance to hear it and take whatever they need from it you know yeah. what i mean so yeah i hope so too i, don't know, I guess we'll see Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our intro music was written and composed by Jeremy Hunt. The As the Story Grows theme is by Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe wherever you get your podcast and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can join us at patreon.com slash as the story grows. Be a part of our community and join the ongoing conversation over on Discord. If you enjoy this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I'll never